What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Luke Gibbons. And this is Elizabeth Guzman Arroyo. And you are listening to Colonized Minds Podcast. What's going on, Elizabeth? All right. So I guess today I kind of wanted to talk about a couple of different things. But starting off, there was this documentary that, uh, as the MC, we went to and we took some students to this past weekend at the Portland Art Museum called Do Not Resist. Have you seen that documentary before? Luke? I haven't. I did really, really want to see it, but but I couldn't. But I heard it was really good. Yeah, no, it was great. Um, it was it was kind of shocking in a sense. So I knew it was going to be a, about police militarization, uh, but I didn't know to what extent it would mm. be and what kind of data or facts they would be introducing. So they, they really took a, a bipartisan approach in a way of introducing the topic from both perspectives, whether someone agreed with militarization of the police or not. Right? Okay. But some of the things that really stood out to me was, one, uh, a professor at Penn State is developing or has developed an algorithm that essentially detects the the probabilities of someone engaging in criminal activity. Oh, okay. Right. And so he, he stated that even before birth, he could predict if a child was going to what percentage a child would have um, to commit homicide? There's okay, so there's so many issues with that. Right. Um, but the first thing I think about, like when you say, it, is Minority Report. Um, Minority Report is it's a Steven Spielberg. I think I want to say it was Steven Spielberg produced it. I don't know if he directed. It, it may have been Ron Howard. Anyway, but it has Tom Cruise in it. So basically, the way the premise of the movie is that you have these three uh, beings. Um, I won't give like too much away about the beings, but basically, you have these three beings. And these beings have visions that are projected onto a screen. They mm -hmm. predict uh, crime, murders, mostly. Um, and so what happens is they project these images onto the screen because these are visions that they have. And then they get these little uh, almost like balls that will tell you, uh, I think it's like who who it is. But then right. the detectives, they have to look and find out like uh, where it's taking place. Anyway, they basically they predict murders before they happen. Um, and then the the police have to then go arrest the people. So they prevent murders because they're able to predict them before they happen. But ultimately, the premise of the movie is like, how do you know? Um, how do you know someone is going to do something if they haven't done it yet? Right. And then the other thing is you're not looking at the conditions that would cause it. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, you bring up a good point because one of the aspects that he was talking about was he really wants to include race or ethnicity as mm -hmm. one of those categories for the algorithm. Because essentially he was saying, well, if we can statistically see that more people of color or marginalized groups are creating more crimes, then why wouldn't we add that to the algorithm, right? Gotcha. Um, and so that was his whole argument. And he really wanted to include that in the algorithm. So like you're saying, like that poses that question of, well, they haven't committed the crime yet, so why, why would you criminalize someone already? Yeah, you do it under the guise of public safety. Yeah, which, what is it, Jefferson, that says, like, the person who picks security over liberty deserves neither. So essentially meaning if you're willing to give away your civil li liberties for the illusion of security, you don't deserve either one of those two things. Right. But yeah, that's how it gets done, ultimately. If that were to be done is you you play to people's sense of security. Mm -hmm. And if you play to people's sense of security enough, and make them value that that's how you can push through something like that but it poses all types of ethical arguments oh yeah very much so the other thing that the documentary discussed was how the u.s department of defense has been essentially gifting these Tanks. armored vehicles <laughs> these like giant yeah. armored vehicles to to local police departments here in the united states and these are the vehicles that you use in war um to be more specific Right. And so as those vehicles are returning from war, those vehicles will return and they'll they'll essentially give them off to different police departments. Yeah. Right. And the, in the contract that they have um, for those vehicles, there's stipulations that those vehicles cannot be used for riot control yeah. or really to engage with any civilians. That in itself, <laughs> there have already been violations. You look at Ferguson, they were using those vehicles. Yeah, we saw it on the controls. And so I guess what happened was the U.S. Department of Defense had a hearing with Congress where they were asked, Congress was asking a ton of questions um, as to the oversight and how they are, how they're operating this program. Yeah. Right. And one of the questions I thought was really funny, also really sarcastic and kind of messed up. 
um, that they're doing this. But the question was, well, how how have you donated two of these giant vehicles to a police department that only has one full time policeman? <laughs> that is the greatest ride to work ever. <laughs> <laughs> So the question essentially that the documentary was posing was why are we why are we militarizing our police? Because we paid for it. Because we pay for it. Yeah, I mean, well, like, what else are you going to do with it? Use it again for the army, for the <laughs> navy. I don't know. I mean, uh, and and this is not this is not to be like political, like you know, at all. But um, it it has been like widely shown that like we 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 don't necessarily always spend money in the wisest ways. Like we, so we do buy things we don't need um across the board um but especially when it comes to uh i shouldn't say especially because it's that includes military spending so it's been well documented that we've bought the military things that they didn't necessarily ask for so i don't know maybe it's a way to get good use out of what you're (laughs) <laughs> and you know you're gonna get them the latest model anyway like why not you know give them the the 2016 version of the of the you know tank right that's interesting <laughs> i don't know i'm just playing devil's advocate <laughs> well one of the comments from congress was that 36 percent, so almost 40 percent of the vehicles that were being donated to local police departments yeah. were new vehicles ah uh, yeah so they did get the 2017 well, I don't know if they got the 2017 gotcha. or 2016, With but the essentially they were they were vehicles that weren't ever used. Yeah. So maybe they just wanted, like you said, the the newest model. The newest model, yeah. I don't know. Um, so I talked about those two things and a couple of other um, other other information, like using those vehicles for drug raids, where in reality, like in one of the examples that they they showed, um, they found like half a gram or a gram of marijuana mm. in this like uh, this little like bag. And then they use that giant vehicle to go and find half a gram yeah. of marijuana. Th- this is my issue with kind of the militarization of police. Like I understand on one, uh, there's a side that says you want these individuals to be safe. You want them to be as safe as possible because if they're safe, they keep us safe, right? But I think there's something... There's something psychological, I think, that happens when you when you arm someone in that way. Um, they're they're going in uh, looking for an altercation sometimes, right? So it's like if you if you arm someone like a soldier, they're gonna behave like a soldier. Mm-hmm. And then on the reverse side, and this is something I think gets lost, and I don't think people really people don't really understand it unless you've lived in in a community and you've been able to see that. When you see individuals who look like soldiers walking around your community, it makes you feel like you're under siege. And and that's something like uh, it's different. I don't think like a lot of people can can empathize with that, like because we don't see uh, we don't see those vehicles in Lake Oswego. Right. So imagine if in Lake Oswego or in Laurelhurst. You had police riding around in those types of vehicles. You had police in that, like in those uniforms. First off, they ain't going for that. But psychologically, it would do something to those individuals, mm-hmm. right? Um, they they might behave differently. And I'd almost be willing to bet you that the police who are patrolling those neighborhoods would begin treating those individuals differently. So that's that's kind of my issue with that whole. Like militarization is that yeah i understand like you want to be able to keep individuals safe but you in a lot of ways like you're turning u.s soil into a war zone kind of right even if it doesn't necessarily have the bodies bodies which we could argue whether or not it does you're you're kind of turning it into a war zone you're giving it that perception there are actually quite a bit of um current and former military officers uh, who were interviewed during the yeah. documentary and who specifically were saying, I never thought that I would see this at home. Yeah. Like, I see this in war. I never thought that I would see this at home because we're the land of the free. Yeah, and then, I mean, think about, and this also has another dynamic to it. Like, imagine if this was um, if this was your neighborhood, right? Especially, like, if you were a police officer. Imagine if that was your neighborhood. It's a little different. Like, it's easier to do that if you live in the next county over. 
or it's easier to do that if that's not the neighborhood you like if that was your neighborhood if you live there it's not saying that you wouldn't do it you're going to follow orders but you look at it differently right you know but it's easier to go into someone else's neighborhood and do that even if you are just following orders right there's there's something about you know that's that's your barber shop that's your grocery store like those are you know those kids right it's just different. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, not to jump somewhere else. That's why I think it's important to have actual community policing. Like, I think I, I'm a firm believer. I think police need to live in the neighborhoods that they police. I also think that they need to be out and about. They should be, you know, they should get out of their cars. I'm not saying all the police are, but they should be out of their cars. They should be walking around the neighborhood. I also think they should have like, a, like, so when I was growing up, we had like PAL, which is like a police athletic league. And so you had police officers who were out like coaching kids Mm -hmm. like i think you need stuff like that like that's and it it means that you look at you're interacting with people so you look at them in a different way right right oh yeah very much so well vice versa yeah as community members you look at police in a different way and as policemen you look at your community in a different way absolutely right and and this is like a visual that i think people should try to try to understand if the only interaction that i have with law enforcement are them dressed in like military garb like they have on like bulletproof vests and uh they're carrying an ar-15 if that's the only interaction i have with them and it's a it's a hostile interaction like that's that's who i think police are i'm gonna be incredibly distrustful of police that's even if that police officer or those police officers never laid a hand on me at all just seeing them seeing them in that way that it builds because it's fear Right. And so I have I'm going to have a distrust of those individuals. But if I actually if I have a relationship where, you know, that's that's my coach. Right. Um, It's a friendly relationship. I actually see them out and they're not, you know, dressed like they're in a war zone, um, because this is the other thing that gets communicated. If you have to dress like that in my neighborhood, what are you saying about me? Mm -hmm. So this is my neighborhood. Like I walk around here and like shorts and the tank top. And you have on a bulletproof vest and multiple guns. Like, what are you saying about that you think about the people who are just in that neighborhood? Right. Anyway, I was saying that to say the more positive interactions that you're able to have with the police. It then means that if you do have a negative interaction with the police, you're not looking at all police or even you're not looking at individual police officers in that way. Right. You don't have to look at law enforcement in that way. Right. So I brought that up because I thought it was a really good, really good documentary. I definitely encourage folks to see it. Uh, I know that it was the day we went was the last day that it was showing in the Portland Art Museum. Yeah. But I think that if there's enough interest, um, we can we can look at bringing the documentary here. We should definitely, definitely do that. But only if there's interest. So let us know if you're interested in watching Do Not Resist. The other thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, Measure 97. Do you, do you want to explain a little bit about that? No. No, I do not. <laughs> no, Why not, I, no, uh, seriously, no. Um, yeah, so uh, I know it's uh, so it's the business tax. Uh, it's a proposed business tax increase. I don't want to talk about it. Um, so this is why. So to be honest, we have to be very careful about what we say um, politically because uh, technically we are at work right now. I mean, this is a part of a job, and. Their rules on what we can say about uh, what we can say about political figures, what we can say about specific measures. We don't want to get into the gray area of you know supporting something or speaking out against something, which is very interesting. Um, you know, I just someone just told me recently like their company actually uh, suggested how they should vote on you know a particular issue. Yeah, crazy to me. Um, that a company would do that. I mean, I can see, you know, saying like, oh, this is how this is how this would benefit you, you like one way or the other. Like it may have an effect on you or may have an effect on your job. So I can kind of see being able to provide some information about it. But to suggest how one should vote, uh, a little interesting to me. So can you share a little bit more? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't share a little bit more just to say that, um, that yeah, um, uh, friend of mine was saying that a company said should said how they should vote on on an issue i think that's really interesting um obviously this isn't a public company 
Uh, but I guess people do that when you're when you're private. I guess you can do that. Uh, but at any rate, so I'm not going to say anything about any particular measure. I would just I'm encouraging people to do this. Read and comprehend. Reading and reading comprehension are two very different things. Um, I think what happens oftentimes is that people uh, people will vote based on like what they hear in commercials. And the idea of like those commercials are that they put people in front of you who they feel like you can relate to. And they say things in certain use certain words that they think are going to connect with you. Um, and then you vote based on how you feel about that particular person. So does, does this person make you feel better? Does this person appeal to you more than the other person does? Um, so I think that's how things are done. But what I would encourage people to actually do is, at least in the state of Oregon, we get this really nice book. And this book has all of the elected officials in it. And it has quotes from them. It says who supports them, who doesn't. It says uh, who finances their campaign. It also lists their platform. For all of the measures, it says what a yes no or what a yes vote means, what a no vote means. It tells you what the summary is. I would encourage people to read that, and if they don't ask, understand, to ask questions. So, what what book is this? So, it's actually a book that comes. Um, it either comes right before your ballot or like right around the same time as the the actual ballot. So, for those who may be uh, listening from another state, great it means we're increasing our reach. But in Oregon, we basically have take home voting. So, we get our ballots in the mail. We get a book. We basically fill it out like a Scantron, put it uh, in the nice envelope, sign it, do all that good stuff, and then we can drop it off uh, at an election office. And so um, it comes. There's like a little, it's a book. It's not really like a book. It's almost like a, not a pamphlet. It's like this paper, it will booklet. Um, and it lists basically everything for the election in, uh, in that packet. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. So, again, I'm saying that to say I don't want to get into the realm of talking about, like, specific politics or specific measures or policies because um, we do have those those rules. Um, but I think just some good, helpful advice for people is to is to read. Um, yeah. Don't just don't just go by what you see on commercials. I think we are out of time. Are there any announcements for today? So, actually, this Thursday, October 27th, PSU is going to be hosting a transfer day over at the Southeast Campus. Uh, it looks like it's going to be from 10 to 1, and they're going to be doing some admissions presentations from 11 to 11.45. So, it's going to take place in Mount Tabor Building in the Great Hall. And what's really, really interesting is, or I think kind of a really good thing, is that they're going to be able to defer the $50 application fee. So, if there are any students who are interested in transferring to PSU, Definitely make sure you check out the uh, the transfer day. And I've got one more announcement. Uh, it looks like we are going to be dedicating uh, a center in the library to uh, Evelyn, Miss Evelyn Crowell. Uh, so for those of you who, who may not be familiar with Miss Crowell, uh, she's actually been living in the North Portland area just right around the corner since 1942. Uh, she's worked, you know, for the Portland Public Schools, uh, Oregon State Library Board. She's been on the Board of Trustees. Uh, she's also worked for the YWCA of uh, Greater Portland. So this is somebody who has been in the North Portland community for a very, very long time. And Miss Crowell actually has donated $100,000 to support young women getting uh, uh, and who are enrolled in the trades program over at Swan Island. So literally $100,000 of her money she's using to support uh folks continuing to get their education. So we will be dedicating the Evelyn Crowell Center for African American uh, Community History on November the 15th. So uh, I just think it's a really cool thing. Like we talk often about gentrification, this effects on you know the students that enroll here, on the college itself, and just kind of on the greater Portland community. So to be able to have somebody who's so ingrained in the Portland community who's still attempting to preserve um, preserve some of that history and kind of pay things forward a little bit. I think it's kind of a good thing. And I think it's worth and worthy of right. recognition. So 
So one final announcement on November 8th, we will be having a live podcast on the second floor of the student union talking about the, the debate, and that'll be from 6 to 7 p.m. So just want to put in a quick plug for folks to put that on their calendars ahead of, ahead of time. All right. <laughs> so you've been listening to Colonize Minds, the podcast. This is Elizabeth Guzman Arroyo. This is Luke Givens. Saying, so what if it's true? <laughs>